First John tonight. First John this afternoon. First John chapter number one, and uh, glad that you're back, and thank you for being here. It's a good morning together uh, today, and looking forward to uh, to the rest of the service today and the message here. And I'm going to start in on um, we, we we're finally past the introduction. First John. Everybody, all God's people said, Amen. So now we're moving on to verse five here, where John really begins to get into the meat of the message. And uh, so just, you know, kind of remember what the letter's for. He's, he's, he's writing us with several purposes in mind, but a couple of those main purposes is that we would know that we know that we're saved and that the Lord would give us joy. Verse 4 says these things, right? We unto you that your joy may be full. So he's, he's writing us these things so that we would know that we know we're saved. Uh, as Luke just mentioned, we need to understand that uh, we, we need to know whether or not we're saved. And if we are saved, we need to know that we know. And uh, that we need to know about eternal security and that kind of thing. And then in chapter, or sorry, chapter one there, verse five, he really begins to get into uh, kind of the meat of the letter. And so we're going to read verses five through ten, and it'll take us a couple weeks to get through these verses. And I just entitled uh, the really the this whole text from five to ten, uh, "Get Real, Get Real." Look at verse uh, five there. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and I pray that your uh, spirit would bring clarity to it. Lord, help, help me as I preach just to say what you'd have me to say here. And, and Lord, we just pray it would be an encouragement, a help, a conviction, whatever you're trying to do. Uh, we just pray that that would be accomplished here. And so we pray you'd bless now the, the reading and the preaching of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So before we get into the, the, the text itself here, I just want to remind you that um, John is very concerned that we understand that we have eternal security. And, and you're going to see that theme just continue through the book of 1 John. He's going to continue to let us know that uh, that once we're in Christ, we're in Christ, and there's no getting out of Christ. And so we believe here and preach at this church and believe the Bible teaches uh, eternal security. But John does allude, or not allude, he, he straight up says, um, if we're living in sin, it will not cause us to lose our sonship, but it will cause us to lose our fellowship with him. And I've made the analogy a few times that, you know, if you're married and... Uh, uh, just because you get into a fight doesn't mean you cease to be married that day, does it? No, um, it, but it sure affects the relationship, right? Dinner is a little awkward. Uh, you can, you know, if you're ever eating one of those dinners where you can hear the utensils on the plates and all that, you know, you know where, okay, maybe it's just us. Um, but, but yeah, no, sin causes us, what's that? <laughs> oh man, if I cook it, I guess. <clears throat> another day, another time, brother, on that. <laughs> All right, but sin does, it causes us to lose our, not our sonship, but our, our fellowship. So let's just review a couple of these verses. John three thirty six is one. Is it just, I'm sorry, uh, this is not first John, but regular John three thirty six. He that believeth on the son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. And so, really, John makes it clear in his gospel, the way that we are saved is through belief in the Son. It's not through any works of our own. And so, if we're not gaining salvation through our works, we're certainly not keeping uh, salvation through our works. And he reiterates that in, in 1 John quite a bit. Um, but, but Jesus even said this, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. And, and if you're not going to believe eternal security, you're going to have to change, literally change the words of Jesus from everlasting to, you know, temporary or until you, you know, until your next sin. Because I often remind people, um, if you could lose your salvation, it would just take one sin. There's always the, the thing about, well, you know, how do I know when I've lost it? Well, it would be the first time you sinned. And you say, well, that's pretty harsh. Well, don't you remember the story of Adam and Eve? 
It was just one sin that separated them from all from God. For all, I mean, in all mankind, it says, you know, Romans five twelve tells us that all mankind uh, was was so, sort of hurled into sin because of that one sin. So if we could lose it, it'd just take one. And then the Bible tells us if we could lose it, we wouldn't be able to get it back because Christ has already died and he's already paid for those sins and he's not going back to the cross to, to be, as, as Hebrews 6 says, to be crucified anew or afresh. And so uh, the, the teaching of the scripture is that once we are saved, we're always saved. The Bible tells us we've received the spirit of adoption. We've received the spirit of adoption of sons. We've received the earnest of the spirit. Um, uh, the, these things are, are, are really cover to cover in the scriptures. So I, I saw a quote this week, and it was a good quote. I, even, I should have uh, wrote, written down who said it so I could give him a, but it's not, I mean, it's not a great quote, but it's a good quote, so I, I should attribute it. But it, he said this, if we could lose our salvation, we would. That's what he said. And that's true. Because, you, again, you can't work to gain it. You, you just certainly can't work um, to keep it. So I just want you to know that because now we're going to get into um, John telling us how our, 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 the sin that's in our life will absolutely affect our walk with the Lord. It'll affect our fellowship with the Lord. It'll affect everything about our life. But what he's not talking about, he's not talking about us losing our salvation. And again, the purpose of this book is that we would have that eternal security. So we could go through and uh, we, we could really, uh, we could show that. Um, and so don't get that confused. However, that doesn't mean we need to live just sort of any old way that we decide to live. Um, because our sin has consequence, and, and not having a, a good relationship with the Lord has consequence. And, and so we need to make sure uh, that we're taking care of the sin in our lives. So we're going to start in 1 John 1 there, verse 5, where it says this, This then is the message which we have heard of Him and declare unto you. Now this verse 5, this word declare that is there, is a little bit different than the word declare from verse number 3, um, where uh, John is is uh, explaining who Jesus is, and he's explaining who he is, and he's kind of giving his uh, uh, introduction as to who he is and established his credibility and, and basically told us, the reader, that you know he had firsthand personal experience with Jesus Christ. So uh, he knew Christ, he walked with him, uh, he, it says, his, and his hands have handled him, and he's declaring that to us. Well, here the word declare, it's just a little bit different uh, uh, Greek word here, and it really, the difference is, um, is not necessarily the meaning. The meaning of declare is the same, to herald important news. What changes is kind of the sense or the stress of the word. So in verse 3, the, the, the declare there uh, stresses the importance of the source of the message. And so he, he's, he's making a case for why we ought to listen to him. He's an, he's an apostle. He, he's a, he, he was with Christ, and he's laying out sort of his uh, the, the reason why we should, would pay attention. In verse 5, the word declare really stresses the importance of those who are receiving the message. He's saying, this is for you. I want you to get this. I'm declaring this unto you. And, and so um, we need to pay attention to what um, John is saying because something here uh, is going to apply to us today. And, and I know that it applies to us because he's going to talk about sin in verses 5 through 10. And let me check real quick. Yep, we're all sinners in here. I just had to scan the room real quick to make sure no non-sinners slipped in. But the Bible does say this in Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So if we deal with sin, and, and we understand this, and, and we've talked about this a lot, if we get saved, we're positionally, we're sanctified. We're positionally, before the Lord, we're declared righteous. But it's not because we're righteous. It's because the righteousness that Christ has given us through his work on the cross. So we're declared righteous uh, in position, meaning we have eternal life. We have eternal security. We have the, the, the Lord is in our heart. He's forgiven us. However, that doesn't mean we're made sinlessly perfect that day. We're going to continue to struggle with sin as long as this, this flesh and blood body uh, is attached to us. So how do we deal with that sin? What is the message that he's declaring to us? Because that's what he says. I have a message for you. I'm, I'm declaring this message. And, and the, the, these uh, verses here, they break down really nice to study, okay? There's a premise, and then there's three admonitions here. And so today we're just going to work on the premise and the first admonition, but there's a premise, and then there's, there, there's three admonitions. So here's how it works. Look at your Bible there. 
The premise is in verse 5, okay? This then is the message we have heard of him and declare unto you. Here it is. Here's the premise. That God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So that's the premise. That's the sort of the foundational truth for the rest of this, this chapter and the things we'll be looking at. Here's the premise. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Now, there's three admonitions under that. Okay, then what are we to do or what are we, what's the preaching? What's the message to us? And each of these three admonitions start with these words. If we say, if we say. So if you look at verse number six, notice what it says. If we say, look down to verse number eight. If we say, and verse number 10, if we say. Now, now here's what I'm going to tell you. We can say anything we want to say. Okay? We can say anything we want to say. It doesn't mean it's true. It doesn't mean it's right. It doesn't mean it's consistently shown in our life. But we can say some things. And John's going to tell us a couple of things that if we're saying them, well, we better be living them. Okay? And so he, he divides these three admonitions with these words, if we say. So we'll get to that in just a little bit, but we're going to start working on the premise first. The premise is in verse 5 there, that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. So we just want to understand a little bit about how God is light. And in my study, I've uncovered three ways, at least, in which God is light. The first way being this, um, God is light in the brilliance of His person. He just is light. God is light. It's a literal description of His absolute brightness, a brightness that cannot be looked upon by sinful man, a brightness that, that uh, you know, it, it, it eclipses uh, the sun and every other sort of brightness. This is who God is. He's, he's just, if we behold him, it will be brightness. He is brightness. Um, we know his first, uh, his first written words in the scripture are, let there be what? Light. Um, we know when Moses went in before the Lord in Exodus 34 and he's going up. You remember that time he's going up to the mountain and he's meeting with God. He's getting the law of God and he's up there and he's spending time with God and he doesn't even realize it. But the brightness of God is is doing something to him. He comes down from the mount and he starts to talk to the children of Israel and they're scared of him because he's glowing. He's glowing. His face is shining. Why is his face shining? Because some some part of the glory of the Lord is 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 is. Boy, I guess we're like little glow sticks or something. I don't know, they just fired him up and he comes down, he's glowing. And, and so he had to wear the veil to cover that up. You remember the time that, that Moses wanted to see the Lord? And, and he just asked it, Lord, if I could just see you. And, and the Lord said, here's what I'm going to do. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you in the cleft of the rock. And so um, I, if, I, if I were to just reveal myself to you, you would just die. You, 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 you can't handle my brightness. You, it's too much glory and, and you'll die. And so he puts him in the cleft of the rock, literally in a, in a mountain cliff behind rock. And so this is some kind of light that pierces rock. I'm just telling you. And then he, as the Lord walks by, it, the, the, the scriptures describe that he puts his hand over Moses to shield him even further from the brightness. And then Moses just got a glimpse of the back of the Lord, all because God is brightness. He is light. That is the description that we get of God uh, from cover to cover in the Bible. By the way, Jesus Christ is described as that light. John 1 verses 1 through 4 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The same came, verse 7, for a witness to bear witness of that light that all men through him might believe. He's light. Jesus' name is light. 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 8 says, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. And notice this, how is the Lord going to overcome the Antichrist and all those things that happen in the end? It says, And shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. When the Lord returns to this earth, He's going, to, he's going to destroy his enemies with the word of his mouth. Revelation 19 confirms that, that he'll be using the sword that is coming from his mouth, but he's also going to be destroying with the brightness of his coming. So God is light. He's, he, he is brightness. It's who he is. The second way in which God is light is 
has to do with his character, the brightness of his character. So God is light is a also not just a literal description of God, but it's a metaphor of the, the picture or a metaphor of his divine character. And I think that, I mean, it's easy to see in the scriptures. And I, I think even uh, the lost world would understand light and darkness, right? Uh, good and evil. I think, I think most people would see that. And so when the Bible says God is light, it's talking about the perfection of his character. And understand, it's not telling us that he contains light or possesses light or has some light or has some ex access to light, but he is light. God is light. That's who he is. That's his person. His character is perfect. It is light. Everything God does is right and good and light. Deuteronomy 32, 4 says, He is the rock. His word is perfect. For all his ways are judgment, a God of truth, and without iniquity, just and right is he. Isaiah 60 in verse 1 says, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. Light then represents good. Dark then representing evil. And I think we don't have a problem understanding that. And the scripture here says God is light and in him is no darkness at all. I, I uh, started to think about that phrase, in him is no darkness at all. You know, there's a lot of things that, that exhibit light for us, but they're not without darkness. Did you know, even the sun, and I would not encourage you to go out there and look at it uh, later, um, at your own risk, but uh, even the sun, when they look at it through, uh, you know, however kind of filter they can look at the sun, did you know there's dark spots on the sun? It, it has, there's some darkness involved. And we, and we think, how in the world is that? It, it'll, it'll blind you if you look at it. But, but God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. And so it's, it's, a, it's a description of His person. He is bright. He is light. It's a description of His character that He is perfect and pure and good. Thirdly, and I think another important way to see this is that God is light in that he manifests the works of darkness. It's simple. Light reveals. Light reveals. I remember in, uh, I think it was 2016, we were doing a remodel in the church I was pastoring. And uh, it was a, it was a, it's a very large auditorium, really high ceiling and and when they built the ceiling, they, they did the ceiling out of these really beautiful, like two inch um, uh, tongue and groove wood planks. And so the whole ceiling was just this beautiful wood. But one thing about having, a, in, over here on the side, they had fluorescent lighting, but the fluorescent lighting was in those little troughs and it shot upward. And uh, one of the things about having a ceiling like that is it doesn't reflect any light. So the auditorium is just, I mean, it's a beautiful ceiling and all, and we can see the ceiling, but we can't see our hands in front of our face. And so as we're doing the remodel and everything, we, we put in a bunch of new lighting. And, and uh, I, re I remember a lady named Miss Jeanette Harrison came up to me the first Sunday we were back in the church and we had just remodeled the whole auditorium. Everybody's excited and everything. And she comes up and she says, Brother Jeremy, for the first time, I was able to read my Bible during church because I could see light illuminates, right? Light makes clear what, what, what was obscure before. Light reveals so, so God's light reveals darkness. It reveals uh, imperfections. It calls out evil. You might think of uh, uh, Isaiah's testimony. When Isaiah met the Lord in Isaiah 6 and in verse 1, Isaiah comes in before the Lord. It's in the, the year the King Uzziah died. He said, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. So he's, he's got this vision coming into the throne room of God. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings, and with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried to another, said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. So here's Isaiah, and he's having this special vision from God, and he's being able to, he's really coming in and seeing the throne room, and he's seeing these seraphim. And they're flying around and they're, they're covering their face or covering their feet and they're crying, holy, holy, holy. And the throne room is there and, and God is there. And, and, and all of a sudden, all the brightness and all, and all the, just the presence of God makes Isaiah uncomfortable. 
right? Can, can you imagine um, the first time that we see the Lord? I mean, just the first time we're in the presence of His glory, in the brightness of His person. Here's what Isaiah said. Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. See, when God shows up, He reveals sin. I'll just tell you, what we'll get to this, but the closer we get to God, the harder it is to harbor our sin. But, but when we hang out in the darkness, you understand, darkness conceals sin. So if we hang out in the darkness, well, our sin doesn't seem to stand out quite so much. But the two, darkness and light, cannot mix, either in science or spiritually. The Bible says, what communion hath light with darkness? Of course, the answer is none. So the premise is this, God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. He's light physically, it's who He is. He has no darkness, He's moral perfection, and He reveals and is a revealer of all sin. So now we go down to our first admonition, understanding the premise that God is light and Him is no darkness at all. John says, here's something we can say, verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness... We lie and do not the truth. I call this first admonition the admonition of spiritual ignorance. Now, don't, don't be offended at the word ignorant. It doesn't mean stupid. It means that you don't know. And so what John's pointing out here is that um, if we're saying, oh, yeah, yeah, I have fellowship with God. I love God. I, I'm all about God. But then our lifestyle is full of darkness. You know what John says? You're not, you're, you're not walking with God. You're fooling yourself. That's, that's what he's saying. He's saying, you're, you're not, you don't, you lie. We lie. You're not doing the truth. So our claim would be, well, um, we have fellowship with him. But then our lifestyle would, would hopefully not, but, but maybe that we're walking in darkness. John is saying, you're lying. You're lying to yourself. Again, I don't believe he's talking about salvation here, although uh, something could be said that if, we're, if, if our life is just consumed with darkness, you, you might want to check out the day that you got saved. You may want to go back and just make sure that you are in the faith, that you did call out to Christ to, for forgiveness of sins. You may want to go back and, 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 and figure that thing out because I'm telling you if, you, if you are one of His, you won't feel comfortable walking in darkness. But it is true that we can say that we walk with God. I'll tell you this, there's, there's a lot of people in our world today who by their mouth have a testimony that they believe in God or love God, and, and they like to throw God's name around. But when you look at their life, you think, man, the life and the mouth aren't matching up. And John says, here's the problem. You're lying to yourself. And, and that's why I called the message, Get Real. We're going to see the, the, the amount of self-deception that John points out in these few verses is huge. We, we, we've, we've gotten so comfortable with our sin and we've gotten so comfortable with, our, with, with the walking in darkness that we do that, that we really do think we are walking with God and, and we have a sinful lifestyle. And we're going, oh no, I love God. I, I, love, I love the Lord. and uh, We're fooling ourselves. It, it can happen. I hope it's not happening, but it can happen. And, and it's hard when we're deceived to know that we're deceived. We'll talk about it more in, in later messages, but John's just trying to help us. He's trying to, um, it's kind of like, um, sometimes we just need the Lord. We, need, we, we always need the Lord. Some, sometimes we need the Holy Spirit to reveal something to us that we're not seeing. Sometimes He uses a message. Sometimes He uses a, uh, another person sometimes he just uses his word like the like james says it's like a mirror we see something that is wrong but we need to know when we're getting off we need to know when our mouth is saying we love god and our our, our feet are going another direction i was uh, i have a friend um his name's greg and he he came to church one day it's years ago 
And, uh, you know, he got up that morning, got ready, got dressed. He came, came to church and he just, in, you know, enjoying the service. Kind of funny guy. And all of a sudden he looks down. He's got two different color shoes on. He's got a brown shoe and a black shoe. And, and you know, he, he, he was just very embarrassed because he'd gone quite a while that morning and at church and everything else. And, and he just he didn't he didn't realize he's he, he, to him. Everything's fine. But to everyone else looking, it's like, uh, buddy, did you get dressed in the dark or what happened there? I mean, one of the reasons I love being married is because I can I can just ask her, uh, you know, how are we doing? We OK? You know, change anything? Got anything in my teeth? You know, you can do that with your wife. Sometimes we need somebody to check us and say, hey, uh, the, the walk and the talk, they're not lining up. Walking in sin. He says that, that, that phrase, and this is going to be um, something that he says more of later, but walking in darkness, walking in sin. It's this idea of having this habitual lifestyle. I'm not talking about, um, you know, every, I'm not talking about every individual time that you sin because none of us are going to be able to live perfectly. There's a remedy for that in verse 9. We'll get to that. When we sin, we confess our sin. What I'm talking about is a, a habitual lifestyle of sin. If, if we're living a habitual lifestyle of sin and saying that we're of God, we're fooling ourselves. If we're trying to live for God and occasionally we sin and mess up and then confess it, that's a different thing. You understand? But too many times, and, and I just believe it's like this, we, we just kind of get used to the way things are. We get used to the way our sin feels. We get used to the sin we've allowed in our life. It was like uh, over at the house. Um, we were uh, going to paint the, the front room and a, a couple of the bedrooms. So we're trying to figure out what color to paint. And so you go and you get the little sample uh, color, and which is just really not hardly enough to do anything with. But anyway, my wife on one side and the other side of this one door right there in the living room, she painted one color here in one color there, just a little spot about this big on each side of the door. Well, then uh, we ended up painting one bedroom, but then life got busy. And it's like, okay, we'll have to paint this room later. And so it's, it had been several weeks. And, and right there in the living room where I sit in my chair and look, I look right at that, that two colors of paint. And it bothered me really bad for the first couple of days. But you know what? I just got used to it. I got used to it, and I thought, hmm, life is this how it is. You're supposed to have a blotch of paint there and a blotch of paint there. We'll get around to it. And, and honestly, I'm, it's just so weird because I, it just totally, it, I just went blind to it. Didn't bother me anymore. And I go to the church planners conference, and I was gone for about a week, and as my wife usually does, she always starts some big home project when I'm gone. And she ended up painting the whole living room and in the, in the hallway and, and all that. So I, I get home, and I'm going, what happened here? This looks great. I had forgotten all about those paint swatches on the wall. She fixed the problem and it, and it just opened my, uh, I was reminded, oh yeah, we were going to do that. Many things. I don't like painting, so the more painting she does while I'm away, the better. But that's, that's how it is with our sin sometimes. You know there's something wrong. You know it's not a good trait that you're having in your life. You know it's not a good habit, but you've just grown blind to it. You're used to it. You see it. It's there. Or maybe you don't see it anymore. It's just a part of you. But you still love God, and you still go to church, and you still say all the things. Don't fool yourself. Someone's, eventually, you've got to come around and go, okay, what's really going on? Let's turn on the lights. Let's, let's get God close enough where He can reveal the darkness in my life. There's this, there's this um, parallel, or, or better said, maybe a correlation between walking in darkness and ignorance. Now, I want to read you a couple of verses. One is Psalm 82, verse 5. It says, They know not, that's ignorance. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. Uh, Proverbs 4 and verse 19 says, The way of the wicked is as darkness. They know not at what they stumble. It's uh, If you've ever had to get up in the middle of the night and you have children, 
You understand what it means to know not at what I stumble, or how you stumble. You, under, you understand what that means. And, and it's just a miracle that you didn't break something on the way to the bathroom or whatever. That's that idea of your, if you're walking in darkness, you're ignorant of what's around you, what you're stumbling in. And I, I just say, be careful not to go blind to the sin in your life. You cannot have fellowship with God and walk in darkness. That's what John's saying. We've got to get real. We've got to, we've got to come to, back to the truth. If we claim to have fellowship with God and yet we ignore the preaching of God's Word or we ignore the Scripture that we're reading or we ignore the Holy Spirit's cues in our life, let me just tell you, we're not in fellowship with God like we think we are. John 3 and verse 19 says, and this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Why, why is it? Why is it that when we're walking in darkness, church and church friends make us uncomfortable? I mean, the very thing that we need makes us uncomfortable. Why? Well, because... Men love, if, if you're in darkness, you don't want to walk into the light. It's funny, when we're, when we're away from the Lord, we don't want to read our Bible. Why? Because we know when we open that thing up and start reading it, He's going to say something to us that's uncomfortable. But that's exactly what we need. Um. I was remodeling a house when I was a little kid, and I was helping my uncle remodel this house. I think I may have told this here, but it just so um, scarred me for life. I'll just tell it as many times. But we're, we're remodeling this house, and we're, we're taking out the sheetrock out of this, uh, this, this family's bedroom. And so my uncle, I, I'm probably, I don't know, six, seven years old, and he gives me a hammer. Always a good idea, right? And so... Uh, Knock a hole in the sheetrock, and he teaches you to knock a hole in the sheetrock, turn your hammer, and then pull. And you can pull the sheetrock off the wall, right? And uh, I just remember the first time I did that, I, I knocked a hole, I turned it, I pulled. And when I pulled, I pulled a big a chunk of sheetrock about like this. And it, it just about scared me to death because right on the other side, on the, on the back side of that sheetrock and in the wall there, were, were cockroaches that were, if, if I remember right, about the size of your iPhone. I just, they were the biggest bugs I've ever seen in my life. Now, they probably weren't that big. They were just monumentally huge cockroaches. And I mean, they were on the piece of sheetrock I pulled off, so then they start running up your arm and all that fun stuff. But what I noticed is all those things just went in the wall and disappeared. They don't like the light. They ran. And uh, then we found out if you hit them with a hammer, they go, Poof, and that was real cool. Anyway, I had a really good childhood. <laughs> That's what happens when, when God enters the room and we're, we're in sin. Hey, it's all exposed. He is light and in him is no darkness at all. I, I can't physically, it, it's, it's just, it's even scientifically impossible for me to mix dark and light. So when I walk into God's presence, all of a sudden everything's revealed. So John, he says this. Look, look at the remedy here that he gives us. And then we're going to turn one place and we'll be done. But look, look here, he says, um, but if we, verse 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. You want to have fellowship, real fellowship with God? I mean, not say you have fellowship and walk in darkness, but you want to have real fellowship in darkness? Get into the light. I mean, could you imagine how your life would, have, would be different if Jesus physically walked beside you everywhere you went? Could you imagine how things would change? Could you imagine how many things would be embarrassing and you'd have to do, do differently? And Well, can I tell you this? He walks beside you everywhere you go. 
It's, it, he already does. I, turn with me to Ephesians 5, I'll, and I'll close with this. I, I went way over this morning. I feel real bad about it, as you can tell. And um, so I'm just going to, we're just going to read these verses here. I think the Bible really speaks for itself, and then we'll close. It, it would just be good if we got real about our walk. If we're walking in darkness, let's, let's stop. Actually, let's just stop walking in darkness. Let's just get in the light. Let God reveal what he needs to reveal. Get it under the blood and get fellowship back. Now, Ephesians 5, verse 1, just a parallel passage. Be, therefore, followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also, also hath loved us, and hath given himself, for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you, has become a saint. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know that no whoremonger nor unclean person or covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath upon the children of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. See that? They're made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. The solution that John gives to this spiritual ignorance that, that at times we face, and we start to fool ourselves and think, Oh yeah, everything's fine, I'm walking with God, but we're ignoring the darkness in our life. The solution is, get back to the light. Go ahead and pick up that Bible and read it. Go ahead and spend some time listening to some preaching and to some sermons that will help you. Go ahead and, 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 and engage with God in your prayer life and, and get back into church and go ahead and call those Christian friends who you know would have made you uncomfortable. Go ahead and get back into the light and He'll restore real fellowship. He'll call out those things that need to be confessed and you can once again walk with Him. Let's pray together. Lord, thank You for Your Word. Thank you for the remedy, Lord. We're, we're so, Lord, we need to know that path back at times. And I thank you for, for revealing it to us in your word. I pray that you'd bless us today as we go out from this place. Lord, it's been a good day and we're grateful for it. We pray that you would have been lifted up and glorified in our midst and that you would be even today. Give us opportunities this week, Lord, we pray to uh, be a, a witness and a testimony. And as we've spoken of tonight, a light to shine out in this, this dark world. I pray that you be with these people, these families that we have here today. Lord, that you would bless them, that you would encourage them, that you would draw them to yourself. Father, that we would be strengthened for your work, and uh, Lord, that we would accomplish your will. I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right.